Hey guys, welcome to the podcast. How's it going? Good. <laughs> Great. Cool. Um, Kevin, welcome back. Uh, for people who don't know you, uh, what do you do? Uh, I'm a partner at Y Combinator. Uh, I founded a company called Wufu uh, back in 2006. I was in the second batch at YC. Um, and that company, um, appropriately, was a no office company. We were all remote all the way back then. Huh. That's relevant to today, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Some early inspiration for <laughs> wow. us. Wow. What are the odds? All right, Mike. So what do you do? Yeah. Hi, I'm Mike. Um, I am a co-founder at Zapier. I'm a chief product officer. Um, and I originally started out as a front end engineer and a product designer. So I have a very deep appreciation for those areas. And I think has kind of, um, how I came to run some of the design team today and have thought a lot about like scaling design teams, um, over the last seven or eight years. And what does Zapier do? Uh, Zapier do? is a uh, piece of software that helps you automate your tasks at work, um, helps you be more productive. Uh, so if you have, um, if you use multiple tools for your job and you're trying to, um, you, like you manually are copying and pasting data from one tool to the other all day as part of like a task you do, you can use Zapier to automate that and have it done automatically in the background. Mm. So an example would be like if you are a, let's say a project manager and you've got a team that works out of GitHub and you wanted to like no, send some notifications into Slack or into Jira, whenever those issues get closed, you could set that up t- just as one example. Cool. And how did you guys meet? Cause you've known each other for a while. Kevin and I. Yeah. Yeah. I came over to the place that you guys were working when you guys were doing YC and we just like talked for a couple hours, but um, it was a really interesting conversation. Basically, I told you, I was like, this is what we did at Wufu. And I was like, you should basically just do kind of a lot of the same things um, in regards to like, yeah. yeah, like think about remote work that you're going to be doing this for a really long time. And then integrations was kind of like, you know, patching a bunch of things together to a form builder mm-hmm. um, was like a feature at Wufu. But I, to me, I saw like what they were doing was like turning that into an actual business. And so like a lot of my insights were like, this is what works for us. It's like really powerful. And I totally get why every other company would kind of be interested in Zapier. Yeah, you're definitely one of the people who saw the early, I think, vision of what Zapier could be. And form software is such a good use case because the data never ends in a form. You want to do something with it. Usually it's once someone submits a form, I want to go put it in my CRM or qualify that lead or put them in an email list somewhere. It's actually interesting that like I think the life cycle of people like getting their business online it's like you start off with like I need like a presence it's like how do I get my stuff out there and so you like website builders like yeah. by default they become really big we didn't realize this when we started but we <laughs> understood this later on was that like oh then people need to figure out like how do I collect data um, from all these people that are coming to us and so right. form building contact forms, et cetera, like all of that became really relevant in surveys. And then the next thing is like, oh, now I have all this new data. What do I do with it? And that's, that's like Zapier's like the next step. So these are like the mm-hmm. three like stages of every company of like, oh, this is what I need. Yeah. And they have just giant markets. I remember early days at uh, Wufu, people would talk to us about like, so what's your TAM? What's like your total addressable market? And we literally would just like, I'm not doing that because it'd be like everyone that ever has a website, everyone who needs to collect data, like, do you want me to calculate that? I have no idea. Yeah, uh, I sometimes so. think those uh, <laughs> exercises while useful are sometimes like a little misleading. It's um, misleading when your market is so ridiculously large. Yeah, yeah. When you're thinking about like a consumer adoption, mm-hmm. you know, you don't ask Facebook, what's your TAM, <laughs> right? Right. And, and for us, when we, when we think about this opportunity, um, certainly when we got started, you know, our ambitions were, hey, can we build like a cool piece of software and support ourselves? Um, but over the, over the years, I think we realized, whoa, we've like tapped into something that almost every person who uses apps and software to get their job done should be using something like Zapier. There's this like excuse explosion in SaaS software in the industry that is like the barrier to entry to creating software is so low and distributing software is so low that you get these niche tools and more and more folks are using these niche tools and bring them into the workplace. So if something almost out of necessity has to exist like Zapier in order to be able to make those tools play well together. And a lot of times just because of the dynamics of the explosion and how many tools there are, there's no one player in that marketplace that's going to be incentivized to go build thousands of integrations with everyone else. Yeah. And but at this customers point, customers want it. Yeah. I mean, at this point, surely you do have to be thinking more specifically about personas and like growing out individual markets, right? So how do you approach it now that you have, you know, so many users? Yeah. Um, honestly, to date, it's still a very horizontal strategy. We have mostly focused over the last seven years about getting more and more apps on Zapier and getting the tools people want on Zapier. I think that's been one of the things that actually surprised me was Hmm. how much growth we've been able to get out of like the initial, 
I guess, decision back in 2012 to build an open platform. Um, looking back, that was definitely one of the like better decisions I think we made in the early days. We built the first 50 or 60 apps on Zapier ourselves, Brian Wade and I, just to like bootstrap that that engine. And when we launched in 2012, we I remember we had live chat, I think, Olark on the site at the time. And we, you know, I, we got literally we launched in TechCrunch and had three days straight where all the chat messages we were answering was just people asking for apps that we didn't support and I had never even heard of. <laughs> and it opened my eyes and opened, I think, all of our eyes that if we're going to get this thing to scale, we have to figure out a way to get those apps on Zapier and we just can't do it with three people. <laughs> so yeah. we it was almost out of necessity. We don't have money to hire. We can't build these ourselves. So we have to get if figure out a way partners can build those things on Zapier. And at that point, we had enough inertia momentum from the launch and from early users that were really excited about the product and that How do you carried us. jumpstart that? Because I think that's like everyone, especially I remember back then, people were talking about the platform. Yeah. You got to be a platform. Like how can you be like Salesforce? And the thing is, jumpstarting that is difficult. Like just because you put up an API and tell people like, hey, hey if you go and do this, then you're going to get benefit. Like yeah. how did you guys in the early days get people to be like, I will program against your thing so that I can be part of your ecosystem when it was very, very small? It is interesting how every... Every SaaS company, every software company eventually you get big enough and you want to be a platform. I think I'd always, I'd heard the heuristic of like, once you get big enough where you could carve off 1% of your revenue and that could be its own standalone business, like you've kind of reached a critical mass that mm -hmm. you could actually build a platform that has legs and can sustain itself. For us in the early days, obviously we didn't have that. Um, I think the thing that we leaned on really heavily was the value proposition to some of our partners building on Zapier. It wasn't just... Most of the time, these platforms plays one of the big mechanics you see people building on platforms is for distribution. Like I might go want to be in the Salesforce app exchange because that way more Salesforce customers can learn about the fact that I exist and might discover me. For us, we didn't have that. We didn't have a big user base in the beginning. The value we gave to partners was around retention. If they mm. built, they integrated with Zapier, they got access to 50, 60 at the time integrations that were maintained and scaled and were adding more to it and they got it let for free. Oh, I So it allows them to go and say, to their customers who are asking for these integrations, no longer do they have to say, hey, sorry, no, we'll put that on our to-do list or our feature backlog, and we all know how that goes. They could start saying, hey, yes, you can do that with our product. Go check out Zapier. Here's a link. It was a way for them to say yes to customer requests. Yeah. Like, there's actually a way for you to do this. Go over There was value here. to them beyond you know just user acquisition that incentivized them in the early days to build on Zapier. Did it end up being that, like, a lot of people on the front lines like recommending you were then support people. Because for us, <laughs> like in our company, customer support was where all these feature requests would come in. And so did end up being, I mean, I I would imagine a lot of them were like, hey, here's the stop guy. Here's how I satisfy you. Mm -hmm. That was very common. Um, we get listed a lot in like help docs, help documentation. Sales is also another avenue where we get mentioned a lot, where we can zap your basically helps them close a deal with a customer that they're trying to upsell or convert into a paid plan. Mm -hmm. Was that like the start of like your dominance in like SEO stuff? Is like, oh, we get people sort of linking to us. Um, the that was a little that was actually earlier. We so we built our app directory before we built the product. Before we launched in TechCrunch, that whole story was uh pre that we had been working on Zapier for about five months, I think, at that point. Yeah. Okay. The very first thing we did when we sat down was we built our app directory, which was landing pages, and we used that to try and gauge what people wanted us to build we were building these manually we didn't we had a very big opportunity cost oh, on our time so in the beginning how how many apps did you guys integrate and do before you actually had people integrating and doing the work for yeah, it was you? like 50 or 60 or yeah they get 50 or 60 yeah mm -hmm. um, but we had landing pages for i think a few hundred at that point and we had email collection on the pages and classic lean startup of just trying to understand and gauge the market demand for this thing before you go invest the time to build it but on launch you had 50 I think so. Yeah. Was okay. Because that was a startup weekend project initially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's where I met uh, Wade at. Actually, I know, really? I'd known Brian for about a year before uh, we started Zapier. Okay. But yeah, I met Wade the first time. Um, I was actually going to pitch a different idea at that startup weekend, and like, I mean, not even worth talking about at this point. As soon as I heard Brian pitch the idea for what was called API Mixer at the time, my eyes lit up, and I was like, "That's what I'm working on this weekend." <laughs> Um, so during that weekend, we we prototyped out actually what Zapier is, uh, like the the core mechanics of like mapping data between apps all came out of that weekend, and I think we had 
we had, we built PayPal and HiRise and Twitter, I think, were the first three apps. How did then. you pick those? <laughs> it was more <laughs> we sat down and said, what would be a cool use case that we could demonstrate this prototype with? Oh, uh, okay. So during the final uh, demo during Startup Weekend, everyone, the mechanics of the weekend is you work for a weekend and then you present to the rest of the crew on Sunday night. And during the demo, we said, hey, wouldn't it be fun if we get up on stage and have people actually like tweet something live and then have people pay us something on PayPal and then you could actually see Zap, like the prototype of Zapier run and pull that data into high rise. The idea was like, oh, we could aggregate, you know, if someone pays you on PayPal and they're tweeting at you, you'd like to know that in your CRM so that you could pay special attention when you're contacting them. Hmm. Right. Hmm. So it kind of came out of a single use case and we worked backwards from that. And, and so at what point do you end up doing YC? Yeah, we applied actually twice to YC. We got the email rejection the first time we applied basically with the prototype from startup weekend so we had no customers no traction basically just three dudes from missouri <laughs> it's a hackathon yeah. project kind hackathon of yeah. project yeah. um so ex- totally useful exercise i think uh but it definitely lit a fire under us i think as far as like what was useful gonna, about filling out the question we're, like, we're gonna show these people wrong did something change while filling out the application um it was helpful to think through what we didn't have yet i think mm. <laughs> for that first time uh, it made us realize some of the things around traction that we were like, there was a big delta and um, still like optimistic with the prototype. Um, but yeah, once we got the email objection, we, at that point we had enough h- hints of success. We were like, we're going to keep working on this. And it gave us actually more motivation I think, <laughs> to keep burning 40 hours and nights and weekends a week for the next few months. Um, and then the second pl- time we applied, you know, by that point we had had hundreds of conversations and chat logs and messages from, Actually, a lot of folks in like the uh, YC network were even using the product. It was invite only at that point. And we were having folks pay. We had our first 10 people pay us 100 bucks to like validate it. And we turned down the price to like, I think, five bucks. And we had a few, you know, 100 people who'd paid us that amount of money. Mm-hmm. Um, so just a lot more social proof and validation that like, hey, this is a problem that a lot of people care about and could be useful. And so at that point, had you guys committed to being a fully remote company when you went through YC? Did you even have employees? No, just the three of us. And we hadn't. Um, Zapier had been, I mentioned we'd been doing nights and weekends for that four or five months in early 2012. Uh, you guys still had like jobs. Yeah, Brian and Wade had full-time jobs. I was still a full-time student, actually, a grad student. I I get the one mm. uh, the one star of, being, of dropping <laughs> out to, to start Zapier. Um, but yeah, after like our full-time jobs were over, you know, five o'clock, uh, we would go either back to our own apartments and work separately, or we had um, one of our bosses let us run to like a, use one of his offices to co-work out of uh, in the evenings. And we'd go put in, you know, work until midnight, 1 a.m. every night working on Zapier, basically. So it's kind of two full-time <laughs> Two full time jobs for the first few months. Yeah, and so demo day happens, and then where? Do, what do you go? What do you do? Yeah, so after so obviously YC, uh, one of the things is moving out to California. So that mm-hmm. was kind of the that was really I think one of the big values of YC for us was yeah. the forcing function to go commit all in. Right, no longer is it a side project. This is actually the full time. Now we could. Did you not fully hours. believe in it by then, or is it like um, you were thought like this is an interesting hobby? Yeah, I think you know thinking back to that time, it was think about our ambitions right it was like hey yeah. we wanted to get this to a point where we could support ourselves be our own bosses control our own schedule mm-hmm. and it hadn't got to the point where we could supplant like our full-time income <laughs> so it was kind of out of necessity that we were running the company the building it that way by t- once we got to yc you know you get a little bit of initial capital we got mm-hmm. an apartment in sunnyvale and that kind of allowed us to focus all time th- full-time on it um after demo day uh I, we actually leading up to demo day i remember one of the problems early problems we ran into that summer was all three of us would wake up in the morning and we we were all doing customer support we had a shared gmail inbox like or I, not even that an email would get copied into all three of our inboxes in order to do support we would have to sit next to each other oh, so we wouldn't answer the same email <laughs> wow and we would be spending you know until m- noon each morning just like answering support tickets and trying to help people get set up with the product and that was chewing up a lot of development and forward progress time so the very first hire we looked at was um someone helps out with support and we had no network in the Bay Area. We didn't, you know, we just moved out three months ago. We didn't know anyone else. Um, our networks were from kind of like our college networks and mm-hmm. from past jobs. And when we started looking at the folks we thought might be a good fit for that, the one person who came to mind was one of Wade's, I think, college roommates. And he lived in Chicago at the time. And we knew we couldn't convince him to move to the Bay Area. Like we, but we didn't want to. And we thought back to like, hey, we were kind of doing Zapier remotely before 
um, start weekend or before YC, like what's, we could give that a try. And this coincided with the exact time after YC where I was, uh, my wife, girlfriend at the time was finishing law school back in Missouri. So I was flying back and forth every two weeks back to back to Missouri and then back out to California to work Brian and Wade. Um, so kind of this perfect storm of like situation where it was like, well, we have some confidence that we can do this remotely because we had been doing it before and the people we want to hire want to be remote. And I had to be remote for part, part of the time. So like, let's just give it a go. So it was very much an experiment in the early days just to think like, hey, this was working. Let's see if it can continue to work. And did you have any kind of plan or structure where you just like, "Ah, well, let's just see what happens and make it it work? You know, more inspiration than plan, I'd say. (laughs) Like you look at folks like Basecamp uh, at the time, Wufu at the time, like we had seen at least small organizations that had been successful at building fully distributed remote workforces. So I think there was more inspiration than anything. Um, A lot of times for a lot of people, they feel like the company isn't real until like there's an office. There's like a lot of ego thing. Yeah. And so I think that's the kind of thing that's amazing about remote teams that actually get really big is like somehow they don't have something that's tied to like the thing, the thing I need to show off. Like they're comfortable with saying like, I got no place to show you. I work from my home. Um, and so like, is that an, like, did you guys even struggle at all about that? It was like, how are we going to be a real serious company without this? Um, it didn't hurt any, it didn't like hurt any efforts in terms of scaling the organization. It's certainly <laughs> even, it's funny how much, how pervasive that like idea is because even I remember probably last year or the year before we'd still have people joining the organization who'd, who'd comment like, yeah, do my parents want to know if I'm working at a real company right now? <laughs> and it's like, well, yeah, we have, you know, hundred, hundred, we have like 50 million in ARR. Like, yeah, we're a real company, <laughs> but, yeah. um, yeah, it's still this is one of the reasons why like some of the PR things that we do are actually useful because we can send those to friends and family and say, hey, look, this this isn't just like a side sideshow. Like this is a real. But how thing. did you not get caught into that trap? That that's the thing is like it, it has to come from the founders, obviously. And so, is it like, one of those things? We like, believe that it was not a or side like, project. Why is it that you never felt like you needed to have an office? No, it's just like peer pressure peer around pressure. startup norms. Exactly. Like, how, wh- why did you not succumb to that? Because that's I, often what I see a lot of people do is that, like, I'm spending this money because I think this is what it looks like to normalize me. Because this I is see. actually very, especially at that time, it's very radical to be like, I'm not going to have an office. Yeah. I mean, when we were talking to like investors and whatnot through YC, lots of raised eyebrows, we'd get folks turning us away strictly because of that. Even yeah, some I'm of sure. the folks who did, we went forward with, like, still would be like, hey, when are you going to? you know, mature as an organization and get an office and start hiring locally, right? <laughs> now, you see a very different opinion in VC, so which is fun to see that mindset shift. But um, how did we resist? I mean, in, their, in like tw- that, those early couple of first years between, you know, 2012, 2014, um, it was largely driven out of, I guess, kind of like the scrappy nature of the organization. Like it was out of necessity because we weren't profitable yet. Um, We'd only raised a small amount of money to like help give us a backstop to be able to scale a little bit faster than we otherwise would have. Mm-hmm. And the networks of folks we wanted to hire were, were remote. It was probably around eight or nine people into the organization when it stopped being an experiment. I do remember specifically yeah. having that conversation with like Brian and Wade around like, hey, this is this is working. Like this doesn't and it was probably I think right after our first company retreat where we went up to yeah. Washington and had like seven of us. Um where it felt like, yeah, this this isn't just like an experiment and like an easy way to get better recruiting. Like this is actually a better way to like run the company. For us, definitely it started off with costs. We're like, uh, we can't afford an office. Mm-hmm. But later on, as things were working, we were just like, yeah. if you have this frugal mentality, we're like, there's nothing about the office and wanting to have a commute that made any extra sense. And we also had relocated from California to yeah. Florida. So it wasn't like, <laughs> oh yeah, our office in Florida was going to be the driving <laughs> yeah. thing for anyone. And so you for know, us, it really just was like, I think profitability was the biggest thing for us. Like we were mm-hmm. making money. And so if someone had some criticism against like, oh, why are you doing it this way? I was like, I'm making tons of money. So I don't really care what you have to say about this. Right. Do, does Wufu still have the best exit to investment ratio? Uh, the YC ratio, exit? yes, in okay. terms of like <laughs> how much percentage of the company that YC owned or, or any of my angel investors yeah. to like the output. And I think we're still in like top 10 biggest exits for YC still. Still? Because of how much equity that was owned. Because we didn't raise any money. You raised what? 
we raised the uh, YC hundred yeah. and eighteen thousand dollars. YC was eighteen thousand dollars then, and I, we raised uh, money from two angels, PB and PG, and it was fifty thousand dollars each, and that was it. I, I was just thinking, you know, I think logistics and practicality was one reason why remote was like we believed in it so much. The, the other reason I think is actually a little bit more tied to um, like Brian and Wade and I, how we like to work um, in the early days. Like I think it goes back to this, that nights and weekends, like mm-hmm. part of the reason and ambition we've <laughs> of wanting to like start Zapier in the first place was we kind of wanted to own our own schedule and like set our own goals and not be beholden to like a giant organization yeah. telling us what to do. We wanted to contr- be very autonomous. And one of like that, that's a, that is a company value. Our number one value is default action. And that permeates all the way from the very beginning where mm. we wanted to like, we wanted to build Zapier as a company that we would want to work at. And if I'm going to go work at it like a big company, I would want that like level of autonomy and no one telling me that I have to be in the office at eight 30 in the morning every day and like control my own schedule and be able to like, just go no go identify good things to work on and do them. So um, as someone now who's hiring these people, do you have to filter out people who think that they want that autonomy, who think that they might want to be working alone from people who actually do? And is there a good way to do that? Like how, how do you get like, the sense of uh, like, is really your company gonna... full of like libertarians who care about freedom <laughs> or is it a company full of introverts? I imagine it's not one or the other, but it's one um, of these things where it's like, I do think we probably attract folks that enjoy sure. working alone more, not exclusively. We do have quite a few folks who are extroverted in the organization who've like been successful and found ways to make it work. Um, one of the things I tell everyone who's going through the interview process is <sighs> you work can't be your family at Zapier or any distributed remote company. Like you, you in the past, it's very easy to lean on your work as that like that a social very connection. Rare, healthy mindset. Um, and in, if you if you're going to make it work at Zapier, you have to find a social network that's like outside the company. You'll get a little bit of it because we do comp- two company retreats. Yeah. You'll see their faces and names all day in Slack. Um, but whether it's like you know uh, f- like side projects or hobbies or like s- close friends or religion or family or whatever it is like you'll def- you definitely want to have one of those networks that's outside the work environment related to this like what are other major characters that you look for that you know this person's going to be appropriate for remote work <sighs> past experience with remote is pretty good uh, is a pretty good signal because they know what they're getting into mm-hmm. um we now with that said we've had quite a few folks who haven't had post past remote experience and they've been very successful but there is like a learning curve attached to it i think the biggest one of the biggest things i look for in interviewing that tells me whether someone's going to be effective or not is like how much they can uphold that first value of like defaulting to action do they have past experiences where they did not take a consensus driven approach and instead said hey this is the right thing to do and i believe that this is the right thing to do and went and caused some kind of action in their previous company or Mm. organization because they thought it was the right but that sounds like a quality that's not just for remote workers. It sounds like you just want that period for any company. That is one of the probably most surprising things I have discovered or observed mm-hmm. scaling a 200 person remote company to date is that um, the types of things you have to do in order to be a successful remote company make you just a generally better company. <laughs> <laughs> they are not unique to remote. However, they you do have to figure them out earlier. And I think that mm. is where a lot of the interesting... When people ask, like, how do you run a remote company? I think that's really where it is because the we've had to invest really early on in how do we what's our decision making frameworks? How do we communicate as an organization? What are our processes? You have to get really explicit about your processes in order to be successful. And in order for folks to have the information that they need to be able to default to action and be able to know how to operate in this organization. Um, so so you mentioned this, I heard this in another podcast about like overlapping time zones and making sure you don't unblock or block and unblock people. Mm-hmm. Um Nina Mehta, uh, who I know, hey Nina, uh, asked a question on Twitter uh, related to this, and that is, what's the best way to share work and knowledge across designers working on different parts of the product without distracting from focused working time? There's an interesting underlying, I guess, assumption here or observation I'll, I, I could say about this, which is one of the benefits of remote work uh, apart, like one of the number one benefits is, of course, from recruiting, you get to hire the best people yeah. anywhere in the world. A secondary benefit that I think isn't as obvious is that when you're actually doing your job, like the best work gets done, not when you're like sitting next to someone and like collaborating all day, there's like, you have to get into deep work, even for a role like product design, which is very collaborative by nature. You still have to like have chunks of time, 
like four hours at a time to go really deep and explore a lot of iterations, a lot of different ideas. And I think this is where like the process part of the organization gets so explicit is, all right, in a, in a co-located company in an office, you don't probably have a lot of explicit direction or like a uh, process laid out as far as when you're spending deep time versus when you're collaborating and coordinating with your coworkers, because I can just tap you on the shoulder, Kevin, and like ask you what you think of my, the work I just did. Where it is in a remote team, we just have to be so much more explicit about what are the processes individual people, individual teams follow when they want to communicate. What were some mistakes you guys made in the early days? You said you have to do, figure this out early, earlier. Yeah. Um, Did you guys make any mistakes? I think one of the f- things that we figured out in the early days um, was when to be intentional about how, how to be how to com- sounds generic how to communicate um, when to raise the bandwidth on communication. There is a when you're in a co-located organization, a company you know, like I'm working in person with you. I the default communication mode is I'm going to get your attention and then I'm going to have a conversation with you and I have full I have the full range of bandwidth right I can use body language I can use my I can stand up I can use tone mm-hmm. um, it's like full full bandwidth between us but I've 100 percent distracted you like you I have your full attention yep. <laughs> now so it's like we're taking two people's times up for this um, in a remote organization the default is 100% the opposite on the spectrum, which is people don't communicate at all. Like if you're, say you're using a Slack channel and that's like your main office, which is how we operate today. If two folks are on a team together, the default is kind of like, you don't say anything. It's a, it's like just a blinking text cursor, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we have to be, we had to figure out when are the right moments and how do we teach the organization, like when to move up that bandwidth chain to move from not talking at all because deep work is important to text is acceptable. It's like Slack or email or something like that to when to move that to a video call. So like, when should I raise the bandwidth from like typing this thing out to jumping on a video call? And then finally, you guys like write these rules down there. There's some like transition moments to look out for, I'd Mm. say. And those are the things that are like written down and shared with the company. So a a good example of one that a lot of folks would be familiar with is like the Slack. Many people are typing message that pops up. Mm -hmm. So if you like one of the things a lot of our teammates, if you see that, that's probably a really good signal that you should be like jumping on a video call at that point instead of wasting or not wasting, but instead of spending, you know, 10 man hours in Slack debating about this for an hour for across 10 people, just get on a zoom call and hash it out for 10, 15 minutes and then summarize the decision back into the team chat tool that you're using. Um, and it cuts down. So it's like, that's kind of, that's what I mean by identifying the moments that it's important to like increase the bandwidth up to. We had move faster. a rule when we were doing remote working where we knew that this was like really painful. And what we h- hated was long discussions happening for t- too long and breaking this sort of like mm. deep work or, or like maker schedule. Yeah. And so for us, we changed the rule to be like, if you're discussing something for like 15 minutes, at that 15 minute mark, just you got to stop. And go on to whatever the next thing you have to do, like to get to like what mm. you say is default action. And when we said like all discussions that have been paused, we ha- set a time for this. And we set it like at the end of the week on Friday when the team meets together. It ended up being like 90% of the time that once they slept on it, they realized they, it's not they that didn't big even of an have issue. to have, have a discussion. They just like they they just magically figure something out or how to compromise or realize something wasn't a big deal. And so usually by the time we get to Friday, not many things were ever brought up. Only the most important things surface at exactly. That point. And so I think it was like I like this idea that what you're trying to default to is respecting someone else's time mm-hmm. and that the only time you you start respect is when you like ha- need to make it really, really efficient. But yeah. then what about on the other hand, where you're like, say you're stuck on a mm-hmm. certain design problem, programming problem, whatever it might be. Yeah. At what point do you say like, okay, I'm gonna break both of your focuses and take your attention full on to mm-hmm. solve this problem or try to solve it? Yeah. That is a, I mean, it's a good question. Um, the The reality is, even if I wanted to get your full attention, there's no guarantee you're going to be able to get it in a remote company, right? Like, I I may not have a path where I can go over and tap you on a shoulder. I might be able to, you know, DM you in Slack. I might be able to send you a calendar invite and hope to get 10 minutes on your calendar this afternoon. But a lot of times you don't have, like, you don't have the same guarantee of being able to get someone's attention that you do in a co-located. And I think that's actually good because it protects the attention of the person who would otherwise get distracted. And the thing, like some of the social, I guess, norms of the organization of how we like 
address that is you know one is in slack if you DM, if you tag somebody in a message like at, at tag them specifically it's kind of the social norm to be to acknowledge that within 24 hours so we have some expectations like that and the reason we have set 24 hours is because we have folks all across the, the world the yeah. sun never sets on zapier <laughs> i like to say um so yeah we have some of these social expectations where there, there is going to be some asynchronicity in how the organization works and operates and it's one of the reasons why i think hiring for default action is so important is if you get blocked in whatever your primary task is and you're waiting on someone else in the org you have to have the bone to go figure out what are other smart things that i can work on that are going to contribute value to the goals and how do i better serve our customers here yeah um if you're the type of person who like as soon as i get blocked i'm just going to sit here until i'm told what to do next you're not going to be successful at zapier or i'd argue most remote companies so how big is Zapier right now? Like how many employees? 200. We 200, just crossed 200. 200. Yeah. And then your your primary responsibility is all the design work that's done at Zapier. Um, I spend a lot of time with our, like helping our product teams figure out what to work on next. Um, and I love spending time with our design and engineering teams. Like, How big is the, the product and design team at Zapier? We've got about seven or eight product managers, a similar number of product designers, and then an engineering org that's about 50 folks attached to that so from my experience i know like how much collaboration is necessary like especially at the start of like building out um new products and sort of like thinking through them and then also designing them Mm -hmm. and then also part of like the design culture is like critiques and so to me that was one of the things that was like really difficult luckily i Woof, it was like, I was the only designer. Yeah. We never grew to beyond 10 people. So it's easy to communicate with yourself. <laughs> exactly. So we, we never ran into that problem. So I'm really curious. It's like, what did you, what's done differently for your design team and product teams yeah. to make that sort of work? Yeah. Um, I think the one of the most important relationships in the organization is the relationship between product managers and product designers. I don't think I'm saying anything new or novel here by saying that, but it's certainly true for us, which is, when we are thinking about staffing and hiring a team, we're making sure that those two folks have are like intentionally building rapport. They're spending a lot of time together and they have a very strong shared ownership over the goals that they're working towards. And how do you do that remote work wise? That's the thing that's difficult, especially when you're trying to respect everyone's bandwidth. Yeah. Yeah. In the, um, in the earlier days when we had started scaling, which we'd started kind of scaling these teams, maybe about a year or two ago. Um, it was, I'll admit it was more ad hoc. Like we were figuring out this process still. These days with 200, um, we've been a lot more, we just have, similar to what I was talking about before, we have to just get a lot more explicit with processes. Um, we started using OKRs as like an alignment mechanism and like a designer and a PM and an engineer all own and share an OKR. A lot of companies kind of have weird definitions of OKRs. Like yeah. how do you guys define OKRs? Like an objective that that team is trying to accomplish. Like, hey, we want to... Um, you know, increase uh, how many users are able to set up a zap by 10% this quarter or something like that. And that's something that a PM, an engineering manager, and a product designer would have shared ownership over. And that for, it gives like, uh, um, uh, it gives a lot of focus to that team. And it also gives the, it kind of helps elevate everyone's role to be thinking about like the impact in the customer first. I think what the thing I've noticed that happens in scaling Zapier is, um, there's a tendency for engineering and PM design to kind of specialize in their own areas and like they have their own unique things they're thinking about all the time, right? Engineer might be thinking all day and about the user experience and engineering is thinking all day about estimates and delivery and refactoring and code quality. PM is thinking about business impact. And if you don't give them some kind of, if there isn't some kind of shared system for how they should value the things that are prioritizing, you get a lot of us versus them mentality that kind of creeps into the organization where it's like, well, why won't the designer do this? Or why won't the engineer do this? So you give teams OKRs versus individuals. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. This is something we're new we're starting to do, but so far it's been pretty fruitful in building that like alignment across teams. And so how is the team checking in on each other? Is it like a stand-up type thing every Yeah, every day? team does a little different okay. actually. So there's a lot of, exp- one of the things about Zapier, uh, that is cool to see is a lot of teams experiment with some of the processes. So you give use. a lot of autonomy to different teams to try a bunch of stuff. Yes, we do. Um, okay, and OKRs are kind of our framework for how we pull, all, how, how we make that not chaotic, if, if, if that makes sense. Um, there, like, I, I like to think about there's like the things that are important to be consistent across teams are the interfaces. 
Like you need to make sure that the interface between teams is consistent so that both teams know how are you. Can be specific? What does that mean? Um, what are, what's our, how, how am I dependent on you? Or what is the API layer if it's two product teams that are building in the same area of the product? Okay. Um, or if it's design, what's the sh- like ownership between and where, where's that handoff? Like what's the scope role, uh, scope of ownership between two teams? Um, so it's like, or to be uh, another layer it might be like, um, uh, if we use a, we use Jira for doing a lot of our issue tracking and project management. And it's, there is some level of consistency that is important to have across all of our product teams using our project management software so that we can build some observability, observability into the product development process across the whole company. So we can get a sense of like, where are we doing well? Where are we not doing well? Identifying issues where we might be over investing in feature work or under investing in feature work or tech debt and things like that. So there's like some level of consistency that's important. Um, but we do generally try to give a lot of individual autonomy to these like EPD trios. To, How are the teams created? Um, mostly on a like. Do you guys assign them, or do people kind of like have a draft, or they are picked and like we hire into them, I guess. So we will create a lane at the like leadership level of the organization. Like, hey, here is a new opportunity we want to go after. Mm-hmm. Here's a new area of the product that we aren't addressing, or part of the f- conversion funnel that we want to improve. Um, and we'll then staff into that. So we've got a decent recruiting team now. We're, so whatever team that someone's on, they kind of stay with that team all the way through the life of Zapier, or it mostly uh, they're long running teams. I'll say that um, gotcha. we've had folks switch. I I wouldn't say we've actually our earliest product team uh, is only two a year and a half, two years old. So Whoa. and some of those folks have shifted. We've had stuff folks restaff from one team to another where there was like another part of the product they wanted to work on, and they had some expertise that could be used somewhere else. Maybe we brought in, you know, maybe this person's like a really uh, senior level uh, experience at engineering. We've just brought in like more of a uh, staff level or associate level engineer. We want to like get them to work together. What's the time frame for like these OK ARs? Like, are they like quarterly goals, like yearly goals? Like or you probably have a, ra- a range of them. Yeah. Annual and annual and monthly tends to be the two kind of extremes. Annual just to know like, all right, where are we, what are we working towards over the course of the year? What is this product team trying to accomplish over the course of 2019? And then kind of monthly check-ins against that where they break those down. And so can you break down how an average team might handle tracking for an OKR? Like, how does that workflow actually go down? Yeah, um, this is still new to the organization. So I feel like I need to give the caveat that yeah. uh, we're learning a lot okay. still with this. We've been practicing with OKRs at the exec level for the last two quarters in 2018, which gave us enough confidence that, hey, this is actually a very effective tool for us to help align and allow everyone, all these different teams and people in the organization to be autonomous and default to action in the ways mm-hmm. that they want, um, that we wanted to start rolling it out to all the individual teams this year um, for 2019. Um Practically speaking, I think the best version of this, and this is aspirational, I don't think we're quite there yet, is you've got some high level of direction being set by the leadership of the organization. Um, what are we trying to accomplish, right? For in Zapier case, we're trying to build a piece of productivity software that anyone can use. Um, h- how do we get Zapier adopted by you know tens of millions of people someday? Um, and you've got this high level direction and strategy being set, and then at the team level and lower in the organization, there's a lot of work that is happening that needs to figure out, okay, where, where is that aligned and how does that bubble up? And there's kind of a meet in the middle approach where you kind of want the work that's happening, 50% of it to be kind of top down driven. And I think 50% of it being bottom up because in reality, the exec team leadership is never going to have perfect insight into all the pieces of work that happen across the organization. And I don't think that's what something like OKRs is particularly useful for us to define every piece of work you're doing. I think it's largely useful for helping you prioritize and make hard trade-offs and have discussions. Like this is one of the things that's great about writing down our process documentation in Zapier, writing down our decision-making processes is when it's written down, you have something to debate about. I can go to you and say, Hey, uh, can we debate whether this is the right thing we should be spending our time on? It's so much easier to do that when there's an artifact that you're talking about, as opposed to, a group of people like with different ideas in their head about what is important to yeah. have it. It just removes this layer of like conflict in the organization. Um, it also discussions can drift when it's not like tied to the artifact. Yeah. 
what other so tools true. do you guys use? Like, I don't have any doubt that you guys like use Zapier itself to help you guys. We are you heavy use, Zapier's, yes. <laughs> you use OKRs. A lot of dog feeding. But I remember in the early days talking to you guys, you guys built a lot of tools for yourself. And I'm just yeah. wondering, like, right now, what's like the most helpful tools that you guys are using, either that you've built yourself or that like yeah. other that you're using from other companies? Yeah, the one that um, I, I actually built this one in the early days. Uh, it's a tool called Async is what the name of it internally. It's an internal blog, essentially. Um, we use Slack as kind of our company office for better or for worse. Like this is where folks usually log into in the morning. This is where work gets talked about. Um, we've got, but one of the tr trouble with that, especially as we scaled is, and anyone, any remote company or any team that uses Slack will be able to tell you this. It, it gets the overwhelming amount of noise in Slack. How do you keep up with Slack? And very early on, we set the expectation that Slack is not a tool you're expected to keep up with in Zapier. You are free to leave channels. In fact, we encourage it. That is fascinating. Um, we, there's a feature in Slack where uh, you can turn off the leave join notifications and we turn that off because we wanted to give folks oh, like great. the social comfort to be able to leave channels without feeling awkward just because it feels like pressure it's like yeah, i'm behind some, on my homework there's some social pressure well, i just end like up muting those channels rather than leaving them yes yeah like we actually have like a course working on for how to like be use, effective at using slack and yeah. happier um but this is in the early days so we so we set that expectation of that's how we use that tool um one of the things that kind of was missing that i saw was what what is our like more thoughtful to use maybe like the Daniel Kahneman idea like slow thinking version of Slack like Slack is where work gets talked about right it's like quick responses in the moment I need a decision okay where does our final work get talked about or where does our more like deeper work that we're thinking more long term and putting together like where are final reports getting shown to the organization and how does that get shown to um, how do the right people get notified that like I have something I need you to read and make a decision on or think about. Um, so this is where in the early days I actually got inspired by um, uh, Nick Francis over at Help Scout. They were using a tool, another remote team called P2. It was a plugin for WordPress hmm. that it was basically, it was kind of like a Twitter feed. Yeah. Um, Automatic was using this internally and that's how they it's run really there. really old. It is. Say, yeah. Uh, we, we worked, we used it at Zapier for a good six months and it was pretty good. It started breaking and we wanted to customize it. And this is one of the most interesting things I've, why I like investing in tools is you can you can tweak and change them to match the like le level of company you're at essentially mm -hmm. as your company gets bigger you're gonna run into these new bottlenecks and you can start like layering in and customizing the tool instead of having to go like throw the tool away and pull, pull, pull a new one in and relearn it so this in the early days P2 started breaking for us it didn't scale it didn't tie into our auth system was funny enough the reason why I wanted to rebuild it um, so I built a version of internally called async, which can just internal blog. And this was kind of the tool that w one of the cadences we have in Zapier is every week we ask everyone to write a Friday update for what they worked on. And this is kind of the heartbeat of the organization. And so um, that goes up on the blog. It goes up on async. Yeah. And this worked really well. It, like in the early days, you got 20 people, 30 people, you get to read everybody's Friday updates. You get mm -hmm. to know everything that's every decision that's made, everything people are learning, all the work that's happening. Well, you get to 70 or 80. 100 blog posts, yeah. <laughs> that starts taking a full day just to read th like all the information. So it's, you start to run into the same problems even Slack does where it's information overload. Yeah. Um, but because we own the tool, we can we can tweak it and tailor it to how we like our, we want to run the organization and how we make decisions and how we want communication to work. Um, we started building like a default feed view where it was a curation layer in terms of, okay, who are your immediate direct reports? Um, who are the folks you need to follow? You can follow folks. You can create custom feed views to like build the curation. We work with managers to like onboard new employees to set up their like views in the right way so that it's curated so that they get the my, just the information they need. Huh. And so, do, um, does email have a specific role, or is it kind of a catch-all for you? We don't send any internal email. Really, that's like my fantasy. Full stop. None. We so we use email. Email is used in a few ways in Zapier. It's we of course we do email support. So yeah. we use Help Scout and all of our emails. Um, basically, if there's any internal to external communication, so like when we're talking sure. with our partners or with customers, obviously that happens over email. Yeah. But internally, there is it's no just email. Just Slack and async. Yeah. These those are our tool. We have one. We also use um, Quip for a long term like long form What's documentation. Quip? Uh, it is a it's a wiki. It's a collaborative wiki, kind of Google Docs gotcha. mixed with the wiki. And that's more for like documentation. Yes. Yeah. Documenting processes, hiring rubrics, things that kind of need to live a little bit longer in the organization. Both async and Slack um, are feed views that roll off. 
one thing people were surprised about with us at Wufu was like how much time we spent development wise on internal tools. Actually, it was like almost huh. like. 30 to 40% of our like development time was like us smart. building stuff for ourselves. That's it's why we were able to grow and only be at like a 10 person company yeah. Yeah, for so long. And so like, what is that ratio for you guys? And like, do you have special internal tools teams? Like, you know, that Facebook is kind of famous for. Uh, we, we did last year, we had invested in an internal tools team, which was helping scaling some of the async software that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, I, for better or worse, have been kind of the internal tools manager for the last six months. I was building, I mentioned this OKRs. We actually built our own OKR software into async. Gotcha. And one of the beautiful, beautiful parts of it is like when you're up updating your OKR, it's got annotations that tie into the post you're writing. So we've got this nice long running graph of, Hey, here's this metric I'm moving over the year. You can see, oh, here's where we launched this feature. Here's where we made this decision, and you can see it annotated on the graph. And but right now, it's kind of just organic. Like teams make their own stuff, or yeah, like it or does tend to be a little more organic. Um, I'll say in the early days, I think we invested more time in internal tools, and it's something I'd love to spend more time on. Actually, mm -hmm. like I was just thinking, just listening to async, I'm like, I know. Remember yeah. this for us. Like a lot of our internal tools I ended up being like. YC companies down the line in the future. Yeah. <laughs> As I'm hearing async, and I'm just like, oh God, that's a startup right there. <laughs> uh, more more recently, most of the internal things that get built in Zapier today are like apps on Zapier. We have a lot of folks in our engineering team and even mm -hmm. more broadly on a support team and uh, product team where we'll build features into Zapier by building an app on Zapier. And this is kind of where some of like the innovation of Zapier comes from is like quite a few of the most popular apps on Zapier were built by like one engineer and a side project at like a retreat hackathon um, just for fun because it was like, hey, we're going to add this mm -hmm. little bit of functionality to the product that doesn't exist. Maybe it's the ability. But it actually made it out in the product. Yeah, eventually. That's we, actually the biggest criticism for lots of corporate hackathons is like people spend all week and get really excited and yeah. then they never make it to the light of day. Yeah, we we tried pretty hard to make like pick our hackathon projects and we curated them in a way that we thought that there was some value that could eventually make it to the make it out to customers in some format or would help customers in some way. So what are the other things you guys do to kind of keep employee and founder morale high across a remote team? Yeah. We do the, probably the biggest thing we do is we do two company retreats a year. Um, even the fact, even though we're hundred percent remote, there is still a lot of value for getting in person. Um, and we don't like discount that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you get to build a lot of empathy. You get to build relationship with folks and it allows you to kind of be assume best intent the rest of the year, right? When you're, when you're in Slack and you're in that working on that tense project and someone leaves, you know, writes a message that might be a little more curt than it should have been. It's like, oh, I, I can hear their voice in my head. Like, I, I know who that is. I understand who that is. Like, I'm not going to jump off and like assume that yeah. they were trying to be mean to me or something like that. And, and that helps smooth over a lot of issues that I think can happen when you are primarily using text based communication tools where you do lose a lot of that tone. Um, mm -hmm. You have to try like really hard to use tone. And it's just that's one of the first things that can easily get lost when you're like intense moments. So there is a lot of value for building in-person relationships still. Um, so we do two company retreats a year uh, where we fly the whole company into usually some cool resort or hotel or place around the U.S. or How Canada. How long are those retreats? So a week. And know, then Monday to Friday. What do you guys do during that time? Is it just hanging out? Or I mentioned there's uh, some structure. Yeah, we've tried a few formats. Um, we've uh, I mentioned the hackathon. We've uh, traditionally done like a hackathon most of the week. And then we would have a couple days set up for teams to kind of break out in their own individual silos. This past retreat, we tried something different though. Um, mm -hmm. We tried giving t one of the uh, things we do a lot. We run a lot of company surveys, and we try to evolve and iterate how we run the company. What does it mean you do a lot? Like how often? Uh, I mean, anytime we're doing a company wide thing, there's probably going to be a survey sent out about like it <laughs> to mm -hmm. get feedback so we can improve it for next time. So Over like, email. Uh, uh, it is tied into Slack actually yeah. <laughs> for uh, how the survey gets sent. I do. There is an email though too. I I'll I'll admit that. Oh, okay, <laughs> you're not there um, yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still I still do keep my Gmail tab open. Um, but yeah, there uh, there is like a Slack tie-in. But we yeah, every company retreat there's a survey. We send out two company surveys a year. I ran a product all company survey last year, so we, we do a lot of that. What's the best um, thing you guys do at the retreat that you didn't do in, on the first ones? Like what has changed that mm -hmm. you're like this is way better to do it this way? Uh, so this last time the thing we experimented with was we added unstructured time. We had always planned every hour of every retreat to date. Where it's fascinating. It's, 
I know. It's this interesting is, you didn't think about it earlier. I, I know, since right? Like, I, it's probably a bias to us like or being like thinking we're, we're in a remote mindset, right? Which is like design the process. How do we want people collaborating? How do we want them connecting? What mm-hmm. and like make that happen? And I think some of our like you know managers feel responsible to make sure their teams are taken care of and people know what they're doing and what they should be spending time on. So there there was just the sense where from the top from a management perspective, like we were over planning all the hours. And one of the things that that prevents is um, cross team coordination or cross team communicate conversation. Or what if like one person from the data team and one person from support and one, an engineer like had this c- cool topic that they talked about at maybe one of our unconference sessions, and they wanted to go hack on an idea. Hmm. Like there was no time for that to happen in the past format. And it just, because we, it was completely top down planned. So we added these two afternoon sessions of unstructured time where we set the expectation that, Hey, it's still a work day, but figure out how to best utilize this time with your team hmm. and your peers. How did you know it worked well? Mostly through feedback at this point. Um, I, I was anxious about it going in. Like I, it was, so we des- we added this process in because of feedback we got before. I want time, like people had to specifically asked for time to do this. Mm-hmm. So we added it in. I was still anxious that like folks would not take advantage of it. I, I, I was worried that they would just default to what they would do if they weren't at the retreat. Right. Just do what, like, I'm going to go do, you know, normal work. Yeah. Stuff. Work on my roadmap yeah. or work on yeah. support tickets in isolation. Um, but we want to take advantage of the fact we're here. So I, I, I overemphasized in almost all <laughs> my conversations with the team leading up to the retreat to like take advantage of the time. And when I walked around and just observed the different groups of people that were co- like coordinating in those afternoon sessions, um, I was surprised at how many people took advantage of the time like given my anxiety i guess that it was not i think it shouldn't be surprising when you're hiring a bunch of people who are like default action self-driven etc and then you bring them all together like they're gonna do the right thing yeah it certainly worked out well um Mm -hmm. and i will continue to do something like that in future retreats i I think can we talk about i'm I'm curious like how do you guys do design critiques like how does that work Mm. in this collaborative environment because it's so difficult Yep. Like to even do it in person. Yeah. And so like, how do you, and you guys have an interface Hmm. that has to bridge hundreds and hundreds of apps together and hundreds and hundreds of different types of features together. And so it's so complex. And I'm trying to think of like doing that without people really close and diving deep on the problem. Like, how does that work for you guys? I guess I'd be interested to ask like, why, what assumption do you have that makes why, what like previous belief or experience do you have, Kevin, that says like, I have to be sitting next to you in order to solve a problem like that? I think it's one of those things where like, for design in particular, I, it's hard to like point, circle, resketch, et cetera. There's like some things that like on pen and paper in mm. person I can show. Now I know that there's ways to do it where it's like, oh, I can do this, show it by video, et cetera. But it yeah. seems slower and more inefficient. And I'm just wondering mm. like, is there things that you could do to compensate or is like you think about it differently? Yeah. Um, it comes back down to being explicit again. So uh, one of the exercises I've done quite a few times with the team has been like the nine box uh, design exercises. Hmm, what's um, that? Uh, fold your paper into like nine boxes and you have like two minutes to sketch nine different ideas of, an, of a solution. And mm-hmm. then you have everyone present their nine ideas and then you do like a remix usually for like a longer five minute session. And gotcha. you come out with a lot of um, just divergent ideas in a short amount of time. And the time compression on being able to come up with an individual idea is intentional to like force folks not to get too deep in the thinking just to like go wide instead of deep. I've run these over Zoom calls where I'll literally ask. I, I did this with the entire company last year, uh, where a little while ago, where I asked, um, I was like maybe the point seventy or eighty people. Um, everyone bring paper, bring Sharpie, and I gave the problem statement up front. And everyone's like just on a Zoom call with their video on, like sitting at their table writing on drawing on their paper, and they'd hold it up and they'd talk about it. And I had them take a picture and post in the Slack channel, so there was like a higher fidelity version that they could see, and they're holding it up and pointing to it. I actually see how that's stronger than normal design collaboration. Like when everyone's in a room, there's a pressure of like, oh, yeah. I can't, I, I don't want to look bad, or like if I'm trying to sketch and figure something out, like it feels uncomfortable uh, to do so in front of a bunch of other people. So I can see how like having everyone separated, it's like, oh, you're working your own kind of state. It feels a little bit more safer to be daring. Yeah, and there's like there were instances where I remember still having to like encourage folks like, hey show it even if you think it's like bad because that's 
some of some of the things you think are weird ideas often end up leading to the right idea even mm. if they're initially like weird um it'll just trigger like a different way of thinking about a problem that hasn't been thought of before um but we've so another process we have in addition to like doing kind of team exercises like this one of our more go-to processes that we've has been working really well for us the last uh, last year was we were doing a um a tuesday thursday um essentially design review across several product teams so we would mm-hmm. invite several product managers several product designers and the tuesday thursday cadence was how we built in that feedback loop process where it's like, okay, I, I want to show something to the team and get feedback on it, get critique. And then it's f- instead of only doing one a week where you'd have to wait a whole nother cycle, there's a forcing function to turn around and iterate and go in deep on it for hours. Think, 48 hours to then turn around and show it back on Thursday um, That's like and show it again. So it's, it's kind of like a bit of a mix where you still get that deep work in between the two review check-ins, um, but it's still on a Zoom call. <laughs> we'll... Um, one of the things I like to ask people to do on Zoom calls, especially in design collaboration sessions, is like don't mute yourself. Uh, Zapier's built up this interesting norms around like how, what what is Zoom etiquette, right? Like how to when to unmute yourself, when to like jump on video, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So we kind of I, I have to like intentionally ask folks to like break that habit and say, okay, for this, please don't give me on mute. So f- to encourage folks to just jump in, right? I, I want folks to feel comfortable not waiting to give their feedback, but just like. To, to generate a little bit more like randomness in that conversation. Um, I think this is probably one of the things that is very interesting about remote. And you, there's a question someone asked around like, how, how do you be innovative as a remote company or how do you, be? and there's some amount of like randomness that you, I think is probably desirable in an organization. Certainly you don't want it to be 50 or hundred percent random, right? You, you want some low level of like, randomness in terms of people talking to each other or what's being shared um yeah i think they're kind of alluding to like serendipitous chance encounters right weird like you know water cooler conversation yeah yeah one of the things we do is uh process we it's called uh pair buddies we actually do three people in these now we've gotten big enough where we have a bot that randomly just picks people that are in a slack channel and says hey two people should or three folks now should uh like here's 30 minutes to chat okay and the idea is like you don't no agenda just like a 30 minute call over share whatever you're working on and talk talk hmm. through some of those ideas i actually think this idea is interesting i actually think a lot of companies or organizations or group over optimize for serendipity like they're like what about that chance moment but to, yeah. to me like serendipity like we were like some random thing happened all of a sudden we have a great idea like that's like hitting the lotto and to me optimizing for the lotto is very weird 99 percent of the company is like we have a whole list of shit that we have to get done and so to me, it's like optimizing for that should always be the first priority, not for the off chance of these other chance encounters. I'm always wondering, like, what is the right ratio? Because I think there is some, I, I think back to our hackathons, right? Mm-hmm. Where this is a totally individual driven thing. And we had great things that got built that no one would have like top down planned to go build and surprised us, like in terms of how popular it became. But I think it works out better when you build up a kind of pressure and then it needs like a release mm. yeah like where all of a sudden it's like oh this is my opportunity for this happen, right versus like yeah well not forcing it just like oh let's like have it all together and then maybe something will sort of bubble up i mean to me like a lot of it ends up getting solved by just knowing what other people are working on which is a problem across every company i've yeah. ever worked at before it's like i have no idea what kevin's done in the past two weeks yeah. right like i know kevin's done been on the podcast very with secretive me. <laughs> yeah I know, I know kevin's like crush an email but like yeah, what has we, he actually been doing we we don't have that problem we have the other other problem which is like i have too much i have too many opportunities to learn what other people are working yeah. on and it's like how do i curate down to like all right who are the people i need to know about what's working on so that yeah. i can do my job effectively so kind of uh wrapping up i'm curious about like if i were to be starting out a remote company mm-hmm. what's the framework you would offer to say like okay you should do x y and z things and set yourself up for success to really get the most out of this i think it is one of the reasons why it is so hard to add remote onto an existing company is because remote well, when you see folks talk about it and ask questions about it, it's always very process and tools based. I think the honest answer is that it's more of a cultural change than it is a process and tools thing. So folks that are starting out actually, I think, are at an advantage in this fact because there is no culture yet. Like it is you or it is your you know, co-founders or whatever. Um, and you have the chance to like set up the culture in a way that encourages things that are going to work in a remote organization. So again, thinking through things like 
defaulting to action and encouraging and empowering autonomy and how are we going to make decisions and thinking through some of those things in the early days. Um, being explicit about writing down and sharing all the work that you do and building it a habit into the organization to uh, write down everything <laughs> that's done and share that with colleagues as opposed to relying on context sharing over like a Zoom call that's e e ephemeral and can get lost. Um, that Those are like the cultural habits and norms that are a lot harder to change in the future um, because you need everybody doing it. And I think there's a structural advantage for folks that are 100% distributed that everyone's in an equal boat. They're all in the same boat, right? I'm all in my home office. If other people aren't doing that thing, then I, I'm not going to be successful or happy in my my own job. Um, so you can take advantage of that in the early days by like it's a lot easier to set those that initial culture up where it's like, okay, we we do want folks to be individually empowered to make decisions. We want to hire folks that have like demonstrated this ability in the past. We want folks that are good at written communication that oh like over communicate even. Like one of the things I often tell new engineers that are joining Zapier and product designers is I have to encourage over communication a lot. Again, coming back to the default, no one talks like um, it is more important and it feels awkward at first to like be just sharing a status update with like an empty Slack channel or a Slack channel where you, you're not expecting a reply. Like that takes that's a habit to build where it's like mm -hmm. you have to realize how useful that is to the person on the other end where, hey, I'm, I might get blocked on something and that status update you gave four hours ago helps give me some context on something that I should be doing or how to solve a problem in a certain way um, that otherwise would get blocked on a you know request response cycle from them. And especially across time zones, that's tough. Um, so yeah, being just setting up the right values around like autonomy and written communication are probably the two most important. You guys wrote a book about this, right? Kind of. We did. Yeah, it's an ebook on running a remote company. It's a couple. I think it's a couple years out of date from a process standpoint, but it gets like the cultural. What's the biggest right? What's the biggest thing you wish you could update in the book? Um. So like one, I mean, biggest thing. Probably how we've scaled async would be mm. what I would go back and like to add to it. Um, in the like the book was written at a time where we didn't we had enough people that could somewhat reasonably consume all the context that was published there on a on a monthly basis or on like a daily basis or weekly basis. That's not true anymore. Like we've had to be a lot more thoughtful and intentional about what are the is it a push first pull kind of mechanism? Um, what's the what's the kind of the algorithm that powers the default feed view that shows content that everybody should be reading in the organization on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. um, and then what are that. like thought leaders and other people in this space that you guys follow for and like inspiration that other people should definitely check out? Yeah, there's uh, several folks that are um, bigger than us that have run remote organizations. Um, it's kind of a little bit of rare air once you get beyond like 50 people though, mm -hmm. or even 20 people fully remote. Um, folks like GitLab is bigger than us. Envision is another organization that's largely remote. Automatic is another early one that we looked up to. Um, I think the biggest thing, again, we took away from those was not from not a process standpoint or even a cultural value standpoint. It was, hey, it exists. This is not impossible, right? Like someone yeah. has proved that it is possible. <laughs> we are not having to trailblaze the fact that like it is possible to have a company with that many people that's fully remote. Um, now they have slightly, I'm, all those organizations have slightly different value mechanisms than we do. So like, that's what we're going to have to figure out as we scale is, all right, how does that, how, how do we apply that size of the organization to where we're at? Um, but yeah, that's the biggest takeaway I would say is that, like remote is possible. There's very large organizations that are doing it. So um, you're in good company if you decide to build a fully remote company. Awesome, that's a Mike. great place to wrap it up. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Gabe. Thanks, Thanks Gabe. Mike.